and being respectful of everyone's time. So I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, we have quite a few guests in our audience and um, some cameras here as well, but that, that should deter us from doing what we're going to be doing today and discussing. So at this time, I'd like to open it up to our co-chairs for any opening remarks. Really? I have no remarks. I don't really have any remarks, but I, I want to say again to this group of people, y'all have been doing an incredible job, and you'll see that you're going to get more work later as we talk about this. Um, so get ready for that. Uh, you will have more work to do. Uh, but also, this meeting tonight, it's in a way our reason for being here, to a great degree. <coughs> because we were formed because there was an action by the police department that revealed just how racially divided the city may be. So just keep that in mind and, and feel free to ask questions. And I would suggest to my co-chairs and all of you that if we don't get a chance to ask all of our questions, and I'm sure the chief would, I didn't ask him about this earlier, but if we have other questions that we need to ask of the chief, I'm sure he'll be willing to answer those and get them back to us or something. Is that right, Chief? That's right. Okay. He just said, okay. So <laughs> he said that's that. all I have to say. Uh, and Rabbi Williams? Yeah. First of all, I want to wish everyone an early happy Thanksgiving. May God bless you with much to give thanks for. Uh, this morning I was out um, raking the leaves with my daughters. And it reminded me when the wind came and took the leaves which I was raking blew away, that each and every one of us are like seeds. You know, we throw seeds up in the air, and one of three things can happen. The seeds can be blown away, never to be seen again. The seeds of our trees can be blown up, land on dry ground, and in essence, after a time, uh, never grow anymore. Our seeds, our individual seeds, can be thrown up in the air, uh, land on fertile gra uh, ground, and later become a forest. A forest of trees, a forest of greenery, a forest of life. Each and every one of us here, not only during these meetings and during the community conversations, have a chance to throw our seeds in the air and to have them uh, come and land on fertile ground. If we are able to build a forest of equity and community among all of us during our daily lives, not only will we succeed in making Fort Worth a better place, but even more so making the entire community and our world a better place, not only for us, not only for those who live in Fort Worth, but wherever good people live. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, next item on our agenda is the approval of minutes for our October 2nd and October 16th task force meetings. Has everyone had a chance to review those? Really? We have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, next on our agenda is an update on community conversations. Fernando? Thank you, Ms. Denver. I think that most, if not all, members of the task force have been attending our community conversations about race and culture. Some of you have attended one or more of these series of conversations and are therefore in a position to share with us some of your observations about those conversations. I have uh, just a few statistics uh, to share with you. I think in general the conversations are going very well. We're getting very positive reports uh, from participants. Uh, we've uh, so far held a total of 22 uh, series of community conversations hosted by 29 uh, different uh, civic organizations uh, from Fort Worth who have uh, either singly or in partnership with each other uh, hosted uh, these events. Uh, we have three additional uh, sets of community conversations scheduled to be held starting uh, uh, in the next few days, going through December, uh, sponsored by six additional host organizations. Uh, we have uh, another host organization, the Potter's House, uh, for which we scheduled a planning meeting sometime uh, after Thanksgiving, and there's one additional group uh, which we've not yet been able to uh, 
uh, to reach a great commission at Baptist Church, uh, uh, which we hope will also uh, sponsor a series. Uh, so the conversations are uh, in, uh, moving forward in, in, in full swing. Some have actually been completed already, uh, and we would welcome, uh, Madam Chair, uh, additional comments from members of the town. For some of you that have attended, do you all have any comments of the uh, outreaches and conversations that you all participated in? I say I've been encouraged uh, the month that I've attended um, feedback from the citizens of the community and it's, uh, it's a little disheartening that the citizens have always wanted this and the city did not recognize it. Uh, doesn't matter the age that they were or the color, race, or background, they've all said we've been wanting something like this before anything happened. So it's very encouraging. I have a question. Did, did you share how many different people have been in these meetings? I, no, sir, I did not. Uh, I don't know if we had that figure. Okay, the reason I ask that is because from some of my conversations, uh, I, I'm just noticing these are, see, very few people there. Ten? Uh, it's, I have a concern that at this point, uh, we may not be fulfilling our objective. Uh, to be quite honest with you, when it comes to racial and cultural challenges, uh, heart change is what, what really changes things. We can make rules all the time, but it has to be change of heart. And until I sit down with other many other people and hear their stories, our hearts aren't changed. And we try to push things through, and somebody may be happy, but it's not, it doesn't work. Um, my concern is that are the people from Northwest Fort Worth connecting with people in Southwest Fort Worth, is that really happening? Because until we hear each other's stories, until we feel each other's pain, and some people even know what I walk through, uh, we, we remain prejudiced. Because we all have a certain measure of that, and I'm just, this is early in the process, but I have a concern that we're not reaching enough people, that, they, that they're too, restricted, uh, we can't tell people to come to certain meetings because they have to go through the screening process. People in my church have said they wanted to go, they fill out forms, they said nobody contacts me. I'm concerned. I'm concerned, that is, it, is it, are people being profiled in order to attend? Is, why, why are there so many roadblocks for a person to be able to go and talk? Whether they're black, white, green, yellow, you know, whether they're, they've lived here a day or lived here a hundred years. It's, it's stories that people need to hear. And I will, that's one of the concerns that we had at the very beginning of when we convened this group as task force. We do want to make sure we are going to look at logistics to see where the voices are being heard today, but we also want to make sure that we reach out to those groups in Northwest Fort Worth or North North Fort Worth or South End of Fort Worth, whatever side of town it is, that we're hearing you know, from those individuals. Unfortunately, we reached out to a lot of the organizations to come and participate. These were the groups that came up. Uh, others, uh, I think it maybe our second task force meeting, Yolanda, you gave us some suggestions of partner house and so forth, and so we've reached out to those groups, but I, we agree. Yeah, I mean, well, what, what I'm saying is, could it be that the model we have needs to be tweaked? I, I, you know, it's like, that's what we've done, but it, well, it, it, because I have a feeling next year's gonna roll around, next summer people are gonna say, what? What task force? What, <laughs> what, what went on? And, uh, and, is the word really getting out? Can people really get into these meetings? Because I just have a concern that they're not. Well, because I know people in my church can't. Okay. Because they've not been allowed to. No, we had said at the very beginning, uh, anyone that signed up to participate, uh, uh, you know, what, we're going to give the organizations opportunity to reach out to those uh, individuals. No, wait, let me finish. Okay. okay. That's so, okay. If they are not invited to go to those, we are going to ask some of the organizations if they would. Uh, uh, please consider doing other community conversations. So the people that are registered to, you know, that want to participate That's will still be able to participate. So you're still able to discriminate because an organization can look and say, I don't want this person, I don't want that person, but here's the only people I want. Because why are certain people not getting into these meetings? 
I don't know. Now, on there, Michelle has, uh, you had on the notes for them to register that it would take a couple of weeks before people got back to them. Because I, she's got to go through the process of, okay, and I hear what you're saying. I, but we're I not trying you, to discriminate it's, against it's, well, I know it's, No, no, we're not trying to. I, I, no, I, nobody in here would do that. Yes. I really believe that. But I'm thinking there are just so many barriers, so many walls, so many walls, so many walls. This, this, and this, and this, and this, and I know dealing with people, I'm in the people business. You give people a maze to walk through, I'm going to say, forget it. Yeah, Michelle, 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 you want to talk I, I can talk a little bit to, to the process and what's happened so far. When we went out and met with these community groups, they um, agreed to organize the meetings. And so a lot of them reached out to their members. So a lot of these first meetings that were held were people that were contacted by the organizations who volunteered. People who have sent in and completed the form have not been tapped into as much as we thought at this point because the organizations have filled up this, the worksheets. That's, that's a broken well, that, but let her finish. Step two. Um, <coughs> we have the ability with the, the, the information that we're getting from the demographics to see from the people who are in the community conversations to see what those demographics are, what groups have we had representation, what parts of city have not had any representation. We're now going to take that and target to try and get some activity in those areas of town where we haven't seen that yet. Okay. We are also, if we we're going to reach out to some of these organizations who've already hosted to see if they would be willing to host another series. If not, the city will plan future meetings with the facilitators that Estrus has, and we will be sure and include all of those people who have completed the form. We here. recognize yes. that a lot that. of That's people have not to. been contacted. <laughs> I'm pretty aggressive. But it's, um, and also I'd like to say that when the organizations have asked for, like they haven't been able to fill a meeting and they've wanted the names of volunteers, we have provided them name, email, phone number. We haven't provided the demographic information so that they could selectively pick certain groups that they didn't but want to But I also know there's a general feeling, I'm out in the community, there's a general feeling that they're not being heard or they're, they're stuck, fell through the cracks. I know this at my church, when people attend, you have a 24-hour window to get back in touch with them because we care about people. And, and if my staff members don't do that, they don't want to be talking to me 48 hours out because our whole business is people. Why are we waiting weeks and weeks and weeks to reach out to a person to at least say we got your information, we're setting something else up, I'm begging us, let's respect the citizens of our city. And I think you do send something out to them. And they got something, when, but we will do a better job. It's just, they're not. It's an know. ongoing process, and so I realize that if someone hears once and then doesn't hear again, yeah. that there could be that feeling that they've been left behind, and that's not the intention. Right. Um, yeah. And we have talked about that in the task force meetings because we've, we've made those same concerns that you're talking about. Oh, yeah. So it's also up to us to make sure that we're telling the community what Michelle's just said. Can and, then, and just another point that the 29 different community organizations who all volunteer to be a, a part of the process, all of their structures are very different. Some is a group of volunteers, some it's a church, some it's an organization that has a, a professional staff. And so you're dealing with, within those organizations, a lot of different variables, too. But we need to do a better job than the city. I understand that. Yeah. yeah. But, but Tim, also, also, there will be at least one other town hall meeting mm -hmm. to which the whole city is invited to. Right. So, and maybe more than that. But, I mean, you guys have more to tell us. More than that. What, yeah, yeah, I couldn't what you, get what, New York. Yeah, that's part of what you need to do. You have to tell us what we need to be doing. Yeah. And we're not doing well. And we said that we could probably do one additional town hall meeting. We at the very beginning, we said we were going to do one at the beginning and one at the end. But depending on how, um, how much participation there was, we could possibly do maybe one or two more. So, you know, it, the doors are not shut to people. We're still working through processes. So it may feel like we're beating up on you, right? Yeah. But let me just tell you that <coughs> the process that we're going to use, we will define that process. Right. right. So we've started the process with a few. It has to get broader. We know that. And the good news is people are interested in hearing what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I would just say we're going to define that. That's what this task force is all about. <coughs> and so we had to start somewhere. So thanks for the yeah. input on the start. Uh, and then we've got some changes we need to do. I'm telling people that, hey, it's, uh, 
It's new. It's new. It's new. This That's is, right. Oh, this is just the first round, and I hope to come to the next meeting. Yeah, we'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> just keep talking. Keep, keep talking. talking. Exactly. That's right. And if, if you have a concern, don't wait till the meeting. Call one of us and talk to mm -hmm. us so that we can get the answers for you. That That's what we're here to help. Bishop Kirkland. I'm not as good looking as Dr. Bell. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Pastor Tim, a couple of things out here kind of annoy me. The one thing that annoys me is that the people who are hosting the meeting have an opportunity to, to define the criteria, who speaks and how. That bothers me. The next thing that bothers me is, what do you mean, Pastor Tim, when you said that people who wanted to speak weren't allowed to speak? Did someone sign up and said they didn't fit no, that organization's criteria? They they heard that they signed up and, and they, just, they didn't get response back. Now, there's a little meeting that happened over this few couple of weeks. Oh, okay. weeks later, they say, well, Pastor, nobody contacts me. Um, and, okay. and then they say, well, am I, then they're, I'm serious, they're asking me, am I the wrong color? Am I the wrong age? And so that's not what we want out there in the community. No, it isn't. But, so there's yeah. a, but there's a perception. But, but again, we have talked yeah. about this before in the past meeting here in our group that this is the process we were going to take and we were going to reach out to those that weren't selected in the first round that we could have another round. We had talked about having trying to have all the committee conversations done by December. That may and may not happen. It could be April next year. It could be June. And this task force is the only uh, task to be together for one year. But again, it could be two years or a year and a half. We don't know. Don't say no because you don't want to stop. I don't want to know. I, okay. But what we want to make sure is that we do hear from all the voices yeah, and, and all the concerns, and we're going to schedule what we need to schedule so that we, as a task force, can make the proper recommendations to the city as a whole. Well, in, in my concern, thank you, Pastor. My concern is maybe someone among this committee has heard something new. I haven't heard nothing new. Maybe a different narrative, but nothing new. And one of the first concerns that I had was we already have all the information that we need to work with and understand we need to listen to the citizens. But my fear is that a year and a half from now, current events will no longer be current events and we've spent a year listening to people and we haven't done any relative work. That's my concern. Well, and our goal is hopefully not to do that. Hopefully we can get sure started. Like but, well, I and that's, what, that's, what, that's the community. Is. That well. I don't want an apology, I won't work. That the people in the community are, are on me. And, and I can handle criticism, you know, but the people in the community are on me to say, look like we're spinning our wheels and, and they're losing faith before we can even begin. Yeah, but, but Bishop, let me, let me just say this, and, and which is one of the reasons that you were on this committee is because you will voice those kinds of concerns. But I guarantee you, that my, my point to the mayor, and I've said it before this committee, my point to the city manager, if this is just for show, if this is just for show, we're, we're, we're all wasting our time. Yeah. Yes, I guarantee you i got a lot more to do than sit here and talk about problems that already do exist. Absolutely. We want to present to this city council by next August some actionable things that they can do. Now, they may not do it just because we offered it, but we will be submitting actual information to this city council of things that we want to happen in this city. I mean, not, not just with the police department, not just with, you know, uh, economic development, but with every aspect that comes up before this committee. So it's on you and everybody else on this uh, task force to make sure that we do that. Yes, sir. And if we don't do that, I'll be right there with you when you go down to city council on Tuesday night and say, this was a sham. But until we do that, I mean, and, and again, we're still new. The, the, you know, this started in August. Yeah. This is still new. Yolanda? I've, I've been pretty excited about the conversations, uh, and I want to definitely piggyback on what my brothers over here said as far as the, the narrative really hasn't changed. We know the issues. It's been not disheartening to hear the stories that the, what the people are experiencing, but one of the th one of the first feedback that I got was there's if you think of it as three levels, that we the people who are taking the time out of their schedule to attend a meeting or a community conversation 
Those are the heart people. So what we're doing is we're preaching to the choir. We're just sharing our story with one another. There's a group of people in the city of Fort Worth who should be at these meetings, but they don't care. Whether they are key decision makers, whether they are CEOs, whatever level of government, whatever it is, there's a group of people in the city of Fort Worth that are not, are not concerned about the meetings, concerned about race and culture in Fort Worth, so they're not attending. So again, the feeling is that we're preaching to the choir, and then you have, again, the middle ground people who are at the conversations, taking the time out, but then you also have this other group of people who are unable to attend because, like Jennifer mentioned, they don't know where the conversations are taking place. They're not connected to one of these organizations that they receive the email or the communication that, hey, this is taking place. So we're, we, the heart people are talking to the heart people. And again, the, what, what movement are we going to get if we're not reaching, we're not hearing from those, the, the voiceless? So how would you reorganize how, it? Yeah. How would you change it? Can, can we first let Esther's talk about why this well, process has worked? I just, excuse oh, me just a minute. I want to, you, you pointed out a lot of things. How would you structure it differently? I believe we can go back to some of the conversations, to some of the uh, recommendations we had earlier. I know when we talked to the host organizations, we told them we would limit that. If I guarantee you, you know, we just have to tell the host organizations, we're going to open this up. We're going to put those, those Facebook events out. We're going we're gonna to publicize where these events are taking place. You attend where you need to attend. Even the recommendation or the, the requirement that you have to attend all three is really deterring people from attending one. So the fact that if I can't attend all three, if I can't commit to 6 to 8.30 for three days out of a week, then I can't attend one. I think we need to do something about that. I think whoever needs to show up or can show up, let them show up and, and, and contribute. And the other thing is, again, we, like we've already talked, we don't, we don't know where the conversation is taking place. So if I'm not a part of the Women's League or the Hispanic Women's Network, how did I know that this was taking place at this location? And we need to do a better job and put it out there so wherever Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. <laughs> Reverend Tim's <laughs> congregation, wherever they want to attend, let them show up and attend. I know we have to have that criteria. I know we have to have it. But it, it's more of a deterrence than it is an invitation. And we need to do something about that. It's good. Look, okay. Thank you. Walter had his hand up. So do you still? Well, my statement is just simple. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything that's been said, especially what Reverend Tim is talking about, because it doesn't matter whether it's north, south, east, or west. The problem is still the same that, we, that comes out of those conversations, that we already know what the problems are. What are we doing about the problem now? We don't want to wait another year or the year's end to, to come up with a solution. We should be working on a solution now on at least those things we know about. One of the things that need to happen right now that's not happening, what's wrong with the city council going through cultural sensitivity training right now? What's wrong with something and that's set up in the city itself and to staff. start dealing with the issues, whether it's social, social justice or economic justice within the city? Those are the kind of things that are coming out of the conversation. I mean, it doesn't matter which side of town it's on, it's coming out. Yeah. And so we need to start dealing with that now. Rather than waiting for a year, we need to be seeing some results and have some, some victories along the way. And they're a part of it. I mean, it's, it's got to happen. Otherwise, we're just spinning our wheels and people are not going to believe or they're not going to support what happens in the very end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Estrus, do you want to go over Because I know yeah. we, we talked about this at one of our first task force meetings of this process. And we all agreed about working through this process. But now that we know we've been through it, there are some comments and concerns of how we can maybe make some, you know, changes. So let me let Estrus talk, and then Roxanne, I'll get you. Okay. Um, so I think we're talking about about a dozen different things at the same time. Uh, there's nothing that says that we can't act on what we already know. I say we. This body can't act on what it already knows. Now, there's not, there was no design that said you could only act or propose something once all the community conversations are completed. That's never been my understanding, and that's not what the host organizations. The only focus, the main focus of the host organization, the community conversations, was to listen to people. To listen to people. And I would love, I mean, Reverend Woody proposes a great problem to have. I would love to open the door, and we can. We can design something that whosoever will just show up. That's a design. We can do that without it saying it's got to be one way or the other. We can have the host organizations doing what they do. That logic is sound. Most of them have been over 20, not, not fewer than 10. So there have been some good results. 
But it doesn't mean that one size fits all. So what I'm listening to is to incorporating this feedback and to proposing some other things. I think criteria is important when it comes to any healthy conversation. If you want to fight or an argument or a debate, that's something different. But I'd be willing to propose something with less criteria to test it and see how it happens. The one, one of many common threads around this country, and Fort Worth is no exe uh, exe exemption, and that is this. This conversation is not about a build it and they will come. That's not the way this works. There are some people that feel like they've been om uh, omitted, their voices have been silent. Uh, Walter mentioned that in one of our early meetings, the working poor. How do we engage them in a way that's legitimate? And the same thing, another aspect that's emerging, uh, Spanish speaking only. There's, there's a number of factions, populations that we can reach. So let's not try to make one size fit all with the host organizations. I think the host organizations, uh, those conversations are working very well. Good feedback. It's just that we can't make them be everything. We have to do some other things. And I would love, I would love to design Here's the date and time. If you're interested, show up. We have 50 neighbors that have volunteered to be facilitators of these conversations. We've got the people power. So that's, that would be easy. I think what you will find, there's some other things on the other side of that conversation that uh, we'll learn when we do a few of those. Your best feedback, I think, comes from your town hall meetings. The best feedback I think we got was at the first one. There needs to be more of those, in my opinion. And why isn't the city hosting at all these community centers something? But there's a lot of community centers. It's free to show up. The people are right there in that community. That's a, a one thing I think we hadn't talked about. That was going to be my point. Roxanne? That was going to be my point, Kathleen, but he said that we, we're expecting the community to come to us to come find these meetings. I'm involved in several of the organizations that are hosting. I look at the schedule. They're all the same days, the same times, and the same places, the same areas. Um, nobody's coming into my community. You know, um, so <clears throat> like what you said, the use of the neighborhood. Is, you know, there are people who are not going to get out of their safe space, out of their community. So why, why don't we bring it to them, to, their, to those communities? And it goes back, I was thinking of one of our very first meetings, and we did our little um, trio groups. One of the things that our group talked about was getting out into those neighborhoods, getting out into those communities instead of expecting them to come to us. I mean, it's hard enough to get people, especially that feel voiceless, to some of these public meetings. Let's go to them. And the community centers are a good way. You know, the, the libraries, the um, city facilities all over the different communities are already there. So based on what I've heard, just with these voices, we can design a menu of offerings that responds to every one of your ideas and suggestions. And then we come back together in 45 days and we see what worked and we see what didn't work and then we go from there. I think this has been great input. Uh, okay. That's what you're here for. Katie. Okay. If we uh, can offer suggestions of things that need to happen right now, along for instance with the city council taking studying cultural sensitivity, I think it would be great if we offered some uh, workshops on white privilege, um, explaining what that is. And the and mayor why attend. It's important. The mayor should attend in every council. Mm -hmm. I mean, that white privilege doesn't necessarily mean economic privilege. That we, we define terms, help people understand this. Mm -hmm. And if there are neighborhoods we need to go out into, I think we shouldn't overlook the west side of Fort Worth mm -hmm. uh, because they're afraid to come out of their neighborhoods too. So, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have a couple more people, and then I'm respectful of time because we do have a presentation to go on. So, Yolanda, you had your hand up, and Bishop Kirkland? No, I didn't. Yeah, I'm not just okay. I think you Kirkland. need to explain okay. to some people what white Walter, privilege means. Well, yeah. But I think you okay. need to explain to some people what that means. But, but what I was thinking, we said August, September, October, November, this four months, all right? And this is my concern. Mr. Tucker, I think what you said is, is excellent that there's no reason why we can't deal with current events to take this committee and form a subcommittee that is looking at, we, we can't start that at month number eight to start looking at current events right now to look at all of these reports, everything I know I'm about here tonight, 
by what I see on the screen already. So let's look at the data that's already there and start to see what we're going to do about addressing some of those issues now. Okay. Uh, just really quickly, to, in addition to some of the comments that have already been made, I think something that would help me as a task force member, as attending all the community conversations that I did, was also a better understanding, being more equipped myself, as as we are developing the process that we're going through between now and August. But what does that kind of look like, Esther? So if you can even give us phases, like you know, yeah. I think some of the facilitating organizations, um, the facilitators themselves, had some insight that would have been helpful for me too, um, just to understand we're in phase one of three or whatever we think they might be, not to, not to box us into anything specific, just but again to also answer some of those questions that we're getting. Where are we headed? And I think that's what a lot of folks want to know too. That's good. That's true. That's good. That? Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's, good. that's, good. that's, good. that's good. Okay, and Rabbi Blaine. You yeah, and we have discussed at our last uh, co-chairs meeting, having subcommittees here so we could start moving forward in actual practical work. We even have them in different, uh, uh, different categories. We wanted to bring them to you before we started assigning because we want people to be in something that interests them where they can make, where we all can make a difference. That is one. I would also suggest, you know, yes, we have things that we can do. We don't have to wait till the end of the year. If we each have suggestions about something that we think can work now, let me suggest all of us email it to the Fernando, to all of us, and we can start seeing where we can go and what we can do without having to wait. Because as Mr. Dansby said, a few good wins aren't only actually wins, they're improvements for the city, which is for the betterment of all of us. Now I agree about the neighborhoods, but I just want to touch uh, for a second uh, upon what Yolanda said, talking heart to heart. If we really think about it, if we've had 22 series of community conversations, and just let's say for the sake of argument, 10 people have been in each one, 20 people, that means we're touching 200 to 400 people, correct? If my math is uh, correct. And each and every one of us has our own sphere of influence. So although we may have taught, taught, uh, touched 200 to 400 people, the fact that we are having these conversations and we ourselves are going out in the community with our own spheres of influence means we have touched many, many <coughs> more. Excuse me. The fact that just we are there, not others are there, if we aren't passing on this message, if we aren't listening from what we are taking there and bringing it forward, then we're not doing our job. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, you know, belittle our heart to heart because our heart to heart in one session continues on to another ring. You know, I, I always say to my congregants that uh, we have the influence to influence other people. And the way we act continues on because the way we influence people, that also influences how they behave towards others, whether it be a friend, a businessman. Uh, a stranger. So if we act in a way we can reach so many more people while we're trying to figure out the exact uh, way we go about tweaking in order to make things even better. We shouldn't look down and say, okay, we're not doing our job. We are doing our job, but we can make our job even better. Good good. All right, we're going to go on to the time to line number five, update on conversations among city officials. Fernando? I thought that last time was going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Too much passion in this room. <laughs> it's all good. Well, okay. I'm happy to report that uh, two weeks ago, the city council completed, uh, along with the uh, various uh, city appointed officials, completed a set of uh, three uh, conversations about race and culture. We had uh, uh, one series for the, for the city council and appointed officials, another series for department heads, and a third series for assistant directors of city departments. And I, I have to say that the response that we've received from all the participants has been generally positive. Uh, that is the first step. Uh, we received comments uh, 
just now about uh, how we need to involve the city council more directly uh, in, uh, in training. Later this year, uh, in, in, the, in the next few months, uh, through the uh, efforts of uh, Estrus Tucker and the National League of Cities, we will be conducting leadership training on race and culture for the city council, uh, for department heads and assistant directors. That is in the scope of the contract uh, uh, we executed uh, with our consultants. So that is very much uh, a part uh, of, the, uh, of the scope of work for uh, the initiative on race and culture. Uh, but, uh, uh, Madam Chair, we've had uh, good success uh, with the conversations among city officials. Uh, I don't think we have uh, the National League of Cities uh, staff on the line uh, to connect at this point, but uh, they were instrumental in facilitating uh, the conversations among city officials, and I think they would tell you that they were uh, pleased with, with the results. So in those meetings, is it possible they can add this class that we're going to recommend on white privilege? Is that yeah. possible? That's, well, that's actually part of, yeah, that's, the that's, that's, training. Yeah, that's in there. That's in the yeah. It's in the training already? Uh -huh. Okay, that's we just need to let everybody know yeah. that. So that's already in the training. Yeah. Was there any highlights or understanding or, or rethinking things from the city council or anybody else through these conversations? The National League of Cities did the... Get the, uh, they facilitated the, okay. and how long were they? Uh, two hours each. Two uh, hours. Two, three, three two-hour sessions. Okay. That's a that's a start. Yeah. Okay. yeah, because this has got to be something that this going to on. It just doesn't stop. I mean, it's got to be something going on. And, and if it's being done right, you should probably see some policy within the city change too, because those things, have, some of those things, have been institutionalized where people are just really not understanding the negative impact of what is going on. I think it's fair to say that the, the conversations have succeeded in raising awareness about issues of race and culture. Whether they will affect action um, is something that remains to be seen. Uh, but I, I think uh, the awareness level has certainly risen as a result of the conversation. Well, if it's risen, then it should affect some action. It should. Yeah, it should. It should. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question? Did all the council and the mayor attend all of the sessions? Most of the uh, council members attended the sessions. Uh, I don't know that there was 100% attendance at all the sessions. Did, Did the mayor? mayor? Yes, oh yes, the mayor not only attended but provided uh, effective leadership in all the sessions. Uh, this is, I, I, I can't speak for Mayor Price, but I will say that uh, she has taken her responsibility seriously to provide leadership on this. Is there any council member that has not attended? Not one of the sessions. I, I, I don't believe, I believe that uh, all the council members have attended at least one of the sessions. Okay. Fernando, my question is, it sounded like the groups were, were divided up to council and mayor. Council and, and appointed officials, officials. Uh, department heads, assistant directors. Those are the three different groups. I would wonder if there's any wisdom in mixing those groups up. Well, the NLC did recommend that we mix the council with the appointed officials. Uh, so, uh, assist, assistant city managers, for example, Valerie Washington and I uh, participated in the same conversations with the council members, and I think there is a lot to be said uh, for that uh, interaction uh, because it, it, it provided uh, um, uh, conflicting perspectives on the same issues. I don't know, Valerie, if you want to add, you were involved in the discussion. I agree. And as far as participation, I, Fernando, I don't specifically remember people missing. And I want to say for the most part, I know the mayor was at every session. And I want to say almost every council member was there at each of the sessions, if not maybe with, a, you know, maybe one or two had a conflict. One or two had conflicts for any of the conversations, but it was, they were well attended. And it was, I mean, good open conversation and dialogue. Um, really mixing up even within that group, you know, we're kind of forcing different conversations. So, I mean, I, I personally found them to be really relevant. Um, and I think the dialogue has been healthy between um, even the assistant city managers and mayor and council members. Does anybody else have any questions? Next is the briefing on assessment of disparities in service delivery. 
And Linda Johnson, do we have Linda? She's not here. She's not here. I, I, I can tell you that uh, we have begun the process of collecting data from uh, our various city departments about uh, disparities in the delivery of municipal services. Uh, this is uh, uh, an important part of the initiative on, on race and culture. Uh, uh, some municipal services are going to be easier to track than others with respect to uh, the influence of race and culture upon the effectiveness of those services. For example, uh, the police department, and of course Chief Fitzgerald is uh, with us this evening, the police department keeps uh, extensive data uh, uh, on uh, how their activities uh, affect uh, uh, residents from, from different uh, uh, races and ethnicities. Uh, but not all city departments uh, track data uh, as thoroughly. Uh, for example, if you apply for, for a library card, I don't think we ask you what is your race or ethnicity, or, nor do we necessarily need to ask you uh, uh, about the, uh, your characteristics. Uh, but we're trying to track uh, the extent to which a race and ethnicity may influence uh, the delivery of city services of different kinds across the city of Fort Worth. We'll be gathering those data, analyzing them, and bringing them back to you as a task force so you can help us uh, to, uh, to analyze and interpret those data and help us to form uh, logical conclusions from them. And we'll be coming back to you in the weeks ahead uh, with that information. All right, perfect. Good. Well, at this time, I'd like to ask Valerie Washington, uh, Chief uh, Joel Fitzgerald, and then also we have some distinguished guests in, in with us today, uh, Dr. Michael Bell, Bishop Billy George, Pastor Robert Sample and Reverend Kim Tatum. If you all would please come up here to the front. Uh, we have some seats up here for you all. And we'll get a briefing on the 3E. And this was all emailed out to us so that we could have reviewed it prior to tonight. So uh, we'll have a briefing today. Madam Chair, yes. I want to correct you for the minute say uh, Robert Sample is Bishop Sample. Now he's been promoted. Uh, yes. so Future references. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Washington. I'll just sort of open this up quickly. I was here maybe a month or two ago and just did a really very brief high level um, overview of the Coleman and 3E reports um, and more of just a heads up because a council member Gina Bivens had asked for a briefing about a year ago um, that we were slow to get on the council agenda so we had been working on that for the last several months. Um, and again, and when I met with you, I said part of the process was me sitting down with the 3E uh, report authors and really understanding the report, um, also sitting down with the chief and having, you know, kind of the five of us all sitting down and talking and making sure that we all were understanding each other and at least um, on the same page about conversations, even just moving forward. Um, so we appreciate the opportunity today. I'm really going to turn it over to the chief and the 3D authors. Um, but I thought it would be helpful, and I think they would appreciate the opportunity to, um, again, from their perspective, talk about the report, um, why they came together, why they thought it needed to happen, um, what their thinking or what their thought process was as far as coming up with recommendations, um, and then how they've worked with the chief um, and really trying to lay down the understanding that the recommendations um, but they were not trying to force anything, you know, to the chief or anyone else here in the city that they really wanted um, just an opportunity to be part of the conversation and have everyone listen and understand um, what they wanted when they were putting the report together. So, and I know that there's, you know, just the microphone here, so that only one person can speak at a time. Um, so I think... So was it the chief? Thank you all. I had the opportunity to work with each one of your reverends and bishops uh, 
here to facilitate really a better communication between the police department and members of our community that are sort of leading the charge for racial equity in Fort Worth. Chief, uh, can you speak up a little? Can please? you put sure. the mic up? Yeah. Sure, as a result of our communications and a result of their persistence in making sure that we, in, we were actually uh, putting forth an effort to accomplish the items, the action items that were on the three plan and within the Coleman report, we put together a checklist of uh, information that we bounced against each one of the gentlemen up here with an effort to determine whether we had made successful strides in any particular area. Uh, some we agreed on, others we didn't, but I think the overall feeling is that we're moving forward and we have a better uh, degree of communication, so to speak, between at least members of the police department and members of our community. I'll let them all speak and then if uh, you'd like, I'll go through some of the PowerPoint slides to, to update everyone uh, as to what we came up with actually on paper. Thank you. I'll defer now to Bishop Sample. Maybe Reverend Tatum or Bishop George, do you want to talk about the history? We'll go after you. <laughs> Wise. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I don't. I don't. Yes, I have to introduce myself. I have. I will. My name is Billy George, and uh, we're here tonight. I'm a little bit. Uh, shaky because they had a meeting today and I didn't get to know what we were supposed to do uh, tonight. But as it relates to the 3E plan, it came into existence because there was a need for some uh, communication as it related to some of the things that was happening in the community. And it didn't seem to be uh, getting the attention of uh, the powers that be. Among those things were tase and death, and uh, so many of our seasoned police officers were being retired early, and that was a great deal on the reports we received of uh, racial discrimination going on in the department where people were not advancing as they should. And, uh, I, as a representative of the Ministers Against Crime, uh, be, tried to begin a dialogue with the former chief as it relates to those items and others that I just mentioned. However, he didn't take it serious, so uh, we came together as a group of four and we, we followed through and we discussed among ourselves what we uh, wanted to present to the city council. We then proceeded to go to the city council and talk with the mayor and some people there. <coughs> and to be very frank, we just asked for the former chief to be gone because we had felt that it was just <coughs> totally uh, impossible to communicate and, and dialogue. So as, as we left, we were still sticking to that resolve and uh, the, the mayor asked us if we would just meet with him. And the meeting took place and I, uh, because of the fact we respected the mayor and uh, we, we felt that we was at, at the end of the road. So, uh, I will, I will just leave it there because it took several months. It took a, a lot of hard work to bring about what, what is known as the Triple E plan and because there was not uh, equality. There was not equity for everyone. So we, we worked it out and the city uh, viewed it, city council viewed it, and uh, the rest of it can be shared. Thank you, Mr. Uh, George. <coughs> Thank you all very much. I'm Reverend K.F. Tatum with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Um, I'm a native Fort Worthian, uh, born and bred, 
with Mrs. Barrett's bread right here in Fort Worth. So, I, I was born premature, but look at me now. <laughs> Overweight and, and uh, out of shape. But truly, it's, it's good for us to be here. We know that we are dealing with some serious issues within the community. And for those of us who have been involved in the issue of community, especially when it's related to the law enforcement community, uh, this is a, a moment, a time period in history that we have been waiting on for a long time. Um, because in past times, we would not even talk about it let alone do anything about it. So you shifted from not doing anything about it and allowing those who have the power to change to force them to bring their heads up out of the sand. And so don't lose focus on that because had we lost focus in, 19, in 2013, uh, we would not have been in position when the Jacqueline Craig incident happened to press our position that had you come to the 3E coalition and those who had put these 31 points of promise before you, then we could have probably saved the city a lot of embarrassment because we would have been making decisions collectively and not in an isolated, uh, top-down decision-making process. So thank you all. Your work is not in vain. Regardless of those who are frustrated by not being invited, this is what I found out having traveled a lot in government. Government is for those who come to government. If you want to be here, Bishop Kirkland, they'll get here. So I want to, Brother Tim, encourage your people to get here. Just got to get here. Got to get here. Your job as leaders tell them to get here. Put down the phobias, the uh, fears, and get here because you'll be blessed when you do come. In relation to our work, my engagement in this whole enforcement piece since I've been back started with Michael Jacobs in 2009. On a summer day, I received a call from a community president saying he had just been killed by the Forward Police Department in his front yard in front of his mama and he had done nothing wrong. So I went to see and everything they said was true. What concerned me and concerned us is the isolationism of the police department not to work with us through this very tragic situation. In fact, until this day, we've never really met about Michael Jacobs or his family. But subsequently, after Jacobs, Rara Thomas, Jermaine Darden, Lopez was before him. You start having these series of deaths within the black community, and no one was addressing them from a systematic standpoint. And those of us who have been engaged continue to push and push. And that family got some remunerations, but not for the life that they lost. But then some happened. These same police officers who were not being courteous to the people in the community were not being courteous to the preachers in the community. Our Ministers Against Crime, which Bishop George spoke very uh, well about. There was a disconnect between the police chief and the black ministers and the police officers association and the black ministers until the mockery was, we're not ministers against crime, we're ministers for crime. And that was the final straw. Bishop George and his wisdom with Bishop Sample reached out across perspectives I uh, asked Dr. Bell to come, asked me to come to the table, and the rest is history. We're here today because people were concerned about mistreatment from the police department. And we had nothing in place to hold them accountable for their actions. With this plan that the chief has worked dutifully on, has put different pieces together, not only our plan, but the Coleman plan, as well as the president's plan for 21st century policing um, in light of Ferguson and other places, I believe Fort Worth has a potential to be a model for other cities to emulate. But let me say this to you all, those of us who've been fighting in the trenches, our fists do not come unballed until we move beyond the talk. If you want us to unball our fists and stop pushing back and talking about this in a concrete, candid way, that 
irritates the process, then come and work with us. And we assure you, we love Fort Worth. And as an old football player, I like to win, Mr. Dan. In fact, I used to cry when we lost. Fort Worth can win. We're losing now. We just better admit it. We're losing. But we can win if we move beyond this and deal with what we have in facts and on paper. And I assure you, our fist will come unballed because we want to hug. But until you stop hitting us, we're going to continue to fight back. So thank you all. Thank this committee. We're here to help. We really are. But we can't help without you willing to accept the help. Dr. King said it this way and I sit in my seat. He said, we're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. And whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be who I ought to be until you are who you ought to be. The rich man can never be who he ought to be until the poor man is who he ought to be. And Fort Worth can never be who he ought to be until we deal with our race and our culture issues. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Kevin. Uh, Dr. Bell? My name is Michael Bell, and I stand as a friend of the truth and of justice. Uh, the, the, the 3E plan was, did not start, the initiative was taken by, as a matter of fact, the Latino Police Officers Association, the LPOA, and the BPOA, the Black Police Officers Association, they came to the community. Uh, Dr. Shabir at that time was the president of the BPOA. Uh, Nesta Martinez was the president of the LPOA. They came to the community because the, they were not receiving, uh, uh, police officers internally were not receiving uh, uh, fair, they were not treated fairly within the own department. So police officers came to us and they needed the community to support them because they were being mistreated, these are police officers, by the Fort Worth Police Department. We eventually went to Mayor Price. Mayor Price encouraged us uh, to uh, talk uh, with uh, Chief Halstead, who was uh, Jeff Halstead, who was chief at that time. When we talked with, Ch uh, when we moved to talk with Chief Halstead, we went through the city manager's office as well as uh, through the assistant city manager, Charles Daniels. Uh, Charles Daniels was instrumental in, in uh, making uh, it possible for us to sit at the table with Chief Halstead, uh, just as uh, Valerie Washington, had it not been for her hand, we would not be standing here right now. That's just the truth. I'm a friend of the truth. And uh, as unpleasant as it may sound, uh, we, uh, uh, Chief Halstead, we met with him, some of the meetings were contentious. But because of, of the city manager's involvement as well as especially Mr. Daniels' uh, involvement, uh, we were able to uh, put together this, this plan, which is a plan on basic policing. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, Jeff Halstead, Chief Halstead, presented it to the city council. The city council embraced it. And uh, eventually, uh, uh, Jeff Halstead was walked out of the building for other reasons, whatever reasons. Uh, and uh, uh, eventually, uh, it, we had a, a uh, there was a period when we were, when this city was looking for a police chief. Every, and I was on that, uh, one of those committees, every candidate had to embrace the 3E -E plan because it's basic, fundamental policing. It's nothing complex about it. You don't have to be a member of Mensa in order to understand it or to uh, implement it. And what happened is what occurred, literally, is that we did not hear from, Jeff, from uh, once we, uh, uh, the police chief, Joe Fitzgerald, came in, we did not hear from him until last September. This is, I'm a friend of the truth and of justice, until last September. When we heard from him, uh, at the, if you look, there are three components of the 3E plan. First, police encounters with citizens. Second, police response to critical police incidents. Third, police plan for increasing and respecting diversity within the department. On the heels of the 3E plan, you have the Coleman Report. 
after the Coleman Report, you had the National League of Cities. And they all came up basic with, basically uh, with the same conclusion. And the conclusion is that uh, neighborhoods of color in Fort Worth are, are being, uh, those members of those neighborhoods are being de demeaned and denigrated. That has not stopped. It continues to November the 20th, 2017. Now, when we said uh, it, if it had not been for uh, ACM, uh, Valerie Washington, we would not be, have sat down. We had a series of, starting in about <coughs> August, I think, I think it was about August, we had a series of, con uh, of, of conference calls, and then eventually we had a conference call with uh, Joe, uh, Joe Fitzgerald, Chief Fitzgerald, and eventually we sat down, I bought our ball. The reason we sat down, the truth, the truth. The reason we sat down is because, and had to sit down and, and kind of deal with this, is because the chief had put on the initial paperwork that uh, on the 31 bullets that they were completed. That did not jive. It did not. It did not. It did not uh, jive with the truth. It is not. It was incompatible uh, with the truth. The truth is that that we were not contacted. We met last year. On, as it says in the report you probably hear, we met last year. When we got to that meeting, the truth is, we got to the Bowling Center, and uh, Bishop George, Bishop Sample, and Reverend Tatum were attacked, verbally attacked. That meeting was contentious. It ended. We had to abruptly end that meeting. That was the only meeting. We had to abruptly end that meeting because they were being uh, uh, demeaned by members of the chief's advisory board. They were attacked immediately. Is that true? I'm asking you, is that true? Okay. The truth of the matter is they were, they were attacked. That's the only meeting that occurred in 2016. There was no meeting that occurred until ACM Washington took the initiative and started dealing with it. When we met, if we had, if, if we had, if during the Jacqueline Craig situation, and, and which continues to this day. If we had met with the chief, if we had followed basic police in this plan, then a lot of things that mushroom would not have happened. It happened because there was no communication. There was no meaningful communication. Uh, if the truth be told, what happened was that, that when we received the information, the next thing we knew, you and I were out in front of the police department. Is that true? Protest. So, uh, as a friend of the truth, and as a friend of justice, I know how to act in, 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 in uh, uh, genteel company. I know how to do that. I know how to respond <laughs> politely, and I know how to observe polity and procedures and all of that. But the truth needs to be told. <coughs> This, your committee, as a matter of fact, in my neck of the woods, this task force is being considered to be a, a, a joke. That's the truth. It's considered because no one really believes that anything meaningful and substantive is going to come of this. We're gambling. I'm gambling tonight that, 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 that you will hear. Let me say this and I'm done. If you go through that report, really what literally happened, what happened, and, and uh, uh, ACM uh, Washington knows this, every and chief knows this, we came to that meeting and nothing significant had been done as far as the 3E pl action plan. And it was said at Holy Tabernacle. It was, there was no one hiding and so forth. I understand the need to uh, project whatever it is that some folk want to project, but I also understand the need because too many people are hurting. I understand the need to tell the truth. And the truth is that we have not made significant progress. Any progress we've made has happened since, I think, August of this year. August of this year. And, when we, and what we've done is we sat down and, 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 and since ho the meeting at Holy Tabernacle, when I believe we were being pretty uh, transparent and candid, since the meeting at Holy Tabernacle, uh, we, ha we have not uh, uh, had any, uh, uh, we we've received paperwork, but anybody can write on paper. Anyone who, who has any facility in English and who, who is 
who is at least decently articulate can can uh, write, and if they if they are wordsmith, they can write anything. But we need what's on paper to to get off of the paper. Uh, in, 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 in my faith, we call it to, to be incarnated, to flesh it out. But it has not been done. That's why we still have a, a pushback from our community. That's why uh, I'm here tonight to, to tell the truth and to let, you, let, let this, this task force know that uh, people are looking at you to see if you're going to do anything or else if this is going to be another Coleman report, another National League of Cities report, another 3E plan, another <laughs> load of paper that is filed conveniently until there is some, some kind of uh, uproar or something, uh, some kind of uh, difficulty appears uh, communally. Thank you. Thank Michael, you very much. Yes. Just quickly, before you sit down, uh, I passed the Omni Hotel today. Yes, sir. There were demonstrators who are still out there. We're, we're going to be there. Yes, sir. We're going to be, and let me say this. We're going to be there. Yes, sir. We're, we're there. Yes, sir. Let's have and, and my question is, what will it take to not have them there? In order for us not to be downtown, we're not just going to be at the under. We're going to be at the, at the state house and everywhere else. The, the reason, the way it's going to take is for this city. We went through the process, uh, uh, Ray. What it's going to take is for this city to be honest and to respond to the three plan. We put all of this before the city. To, 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 which is basic police, uh, for, the, for, us to, for us to look at, for the city to have a dialogue rather than to talk uh, uh, at us, to talk with us. If the city, we said this, if the city, we put several conditions and demands for visions, however you want to characterize it, before the council. If they can't do it, tell us why not. Can you call a moratorium until we finish our work? No, sir. Because you know why we can't call a moratorium? And I'm going to ask you. Because is this going to be, when, when you finish your work, is this going to be any different than anything else, actually? Can you give us that chance? No, sir. Okay. No, sir. We cannot because, because and we would love to. We would love to. You, do you, you know that we have a zillion more things to do. Yes, but, sir. But, but. If this city decides that they're going to turn a deaf ear to, to communities, not only to the African American community, but to the Latino community, and going to turn a deaf ear, if this city continues to do that, then if we jump through all of the hoops and been through the process, then what do we do? Okay. Thank you, sir. I, mean, I know we got here from the chief. Uh, Mrs. Yeah. Bell. Yes, sir. Let me, I, I assure you, this is not a joke, and there is no punchline. Mm -hmm. Your people protesting, mm -hmm. I need them to come to the meeting mm -hmm. when they're not protesting. Mm -hmm. They're not protesting. Please come and sit at the table. I want to hear from them, not as a group, mm -hmm. not as you speaking for them. I want to hear individually mm -hmm. what their concerns are. Mm -hmm. That can happen. You have got to be optimistic and not pessimistic. You've got to. I forgive your saying what I've got to be. I forgive that. I, need I you understand to be. that. I and need I, you and to I understand be. the psychology behind it. I'm cool with that. I need you to be. Now, having said that, I hear what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bishop Sample, do you want to say? Well, I have, uh, thank you for the opportunity. I will just say briefly. I'm one who operates with hope and confidence that when good intentions are put in place that you can see results. So we all here because we have hope that something good is going to occur. Uh, I might just flip back just for a moment because we would not have been here as first stated by these men had it been that the department in which we were looking for safety in care from did not provide that under its former leadership. Um, in our first meeting, I think we dealt with Chief Halstead, and he was trying to give to us some reasons why things were not being done. I said, well, you're the chief. That's right. Did I not say that? You did say it. And if you don't, do not take action to bring about what your department represents as a unified city, then we are all under attack. You said that. 
And of course, from that, we had many conversations and many things were done. We had many um, tense moments. And there had not been that, again, we had uh, support from the assistant city manager. I don't think we would have gotten this far. No. I want to say in conjunction with that phase forward, forwarding, uh, I'm certainly happy that we have Mrs. Wa Ms. Washington here tonight. And she has been a staunch support and a link between the chief of police and us. And I think we've come to a place at the table where the, the voice of what we're trying to represent as community is not a, a multiple of us, though there are many communities, but it's really just one community in one city. I've been here for 60 years. I look young, but I'm pretty old and rascal. I'm turning into that. <laughs> been pastoring for 48 years at where I am now. And I do, people come from Plano, Keller, four, I mean, some people drive 40 miles to come to our sanctuary. They don't want to come in and come to a city that's always in a rut row. Mm -hmm. They can stop in Dallas or any other place. So let me conclude by saying, I hope that from this meeting today, with the good intention that we have and the chief has displayed with the assistant city manager, most recently, and I must say that in conjunction with what Dr. Bell said in some things, although we differ in a lot of things. Right. Had not been for the grace of God, we wouldn't even be here. There you go. You're right. We've had some contentious moments to where that, <laughs> You're right. You know, You're it doesn't right. have to do with color. It has to do with what's right. Yes, sir. Right. And I say it does have to do with color. It has to do with because we all, it doesn't matter about the explanation. We just, we're just in one world and one, all of us have to do this. I, I say I conclude. So what I would love to see is to see what we've done now, come to this point, 3E e. Coleman Report, be utilized in unifying effort Thank you. so we can get something done. There you go. We want to see it done. And I'm, I'm peace about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bishop. And uh, I conclude. I know I rambled, but uh, that's, that's what happened on the end. Thank you all for being here and that's your comments. We want to thank you all for being here. And then I, before the chief comes up, I want to say even in hearing the feedback from the four authors, you can tell that they're, I mean, they clearly have different approaches, different philosophies, um, and that's why in sitting down with them and getting to know all four of them together, I was impressed at them being able to sit down at a table and come up with recommendations that were reasonable and made sense. Um, but I will say as part of this too, and we've talked that these conversations are difficult and not everyone is happy. And, um, and so I think, and I would disagree with Dr. Bell's perspective in that, I mean, I too come from a, a place of hope and I feel hopeful that as we're moving forward, we're having honest conversations. I think when we're talking through the recommendations um, and even sitting down with the chief, I mean, we talk nitty gritty. What could these, you know, what do you think of this? Would you change it? Um, and they're not always good conversations, and not, they are not always going to agree. And the, I mean, so they are, you know, there are definitely personalities, but I do think that everyone is here, and they do want to move forward and That's be true. positive. That's true. And these conversations are difficult when you're being honest. And um, and I think the chief can acknowledge, everyone can acknowledge that there have been hurt feelings. Um, even when I reached out to the ministers, I mean, I, I'm new to this community, but I'm sitting in council meetings mm -hmm. and having people mm -hmm. come up meeting right. after meeting, and they clearly have issues. I mean, I couldn't sit there and say everything is okay. Clearly, there seemed to be a disconnect that I didn't understand in the 3E report and what the chief was doing and what they were, you know, what they had wanted. Um, I do think that a lot had been done that just hadn't been communicated. Um, for example, in the Coleman report, or in the uh, 3E report, it called for doing a use of force, uh, a use of force evaluation and um, changing general orders, and those things have been done. Right. However, we had not communicated that, that those things had been done. Um, so I would just refute that I think that there have been significant things done in the recommendations. Um, I do think there's still more room to go, and that's why we're in this forum to have it, but um, I do think that we're in a positive place um, I know Dr. Bell's, he's, he's getting there, I think, and he's, <laughs> I think as we have these conversations and, um, you know, it just like I said, we're honest and are willing to work through the conflict, I think we can move forward. But there have definitely been hurt feelings between, you know, the chief and, 
this group, and uh, but I think that they're at a place to work through that, and that everyone is focused on moving forward. Uh, but we did spend time talking and not rehashing her feelings, but we definitely spent time in our meetings working through that. Uh, but I, I'm hopeful that we're at a space where they trust that the chief can move this forward um, and that we can mid-course correct and things that hadn't been done, we can come up with an action plan where we can be held accountable to getting them done. So. Chief, Jerry? Can I ask a question? Can I ask just one question? Mm -hmm. I, I, first of all, I want to uh, thank you guys for you know, what you've done. I mean, while we're here, but I've just got a question too. We're talking about you know transparency and communication. How do you guys feel about the city restricting the amount of time that you have to speak to the council? The city, Mr. Dansby, go ahead. Mr. Dansby, the city continues to be reactive and. Uh, uh, the, the, the bullhorn uh, law uh, is, is their response to our using the bullhorn in Tanglewood and Mira Vista. Uh, the, the cutting down of, of the limiting, uh, that, that, that's something that they rather do than to try and work through these issues and, and to, to, to uh, come to a, a conclusion that's going to be best for all of Fort Worth not just any particular community, but that's going to be best for all of Fort Worth and in the interest of justice. So uh, if that's what they want to do, uh, then we bring five more people, but, <laughs> and so we do 15 minutes with five different people rather than 10 minutes with one. But uh, the thing is, is this, is that, uh, it, it's just the city doing what it normally does, the, the mayor and council. I could just have one thing before, because maybe I'm preempted in my thoughts, but, the chief kind of foreshadowed maybe you guys maybe have a difference of opinion of some of the successes um, of the 3E plan. And I, and I perceive that that's what this presentation is going to be about. And I would ask all four of you, gentlemen, who I have great deal of respect for, to pay attention to this presentation and maybe what the city see or views as the success of the 3E plan that you don't quite see. So if you'll take mental notes of those things. I, I'd like to hear that. Is there a uh, All right. Can advance the slide then it's not working all right this is just a basic overview slide on a three action plan some of this was spoken to already I'll try to be concise reasonably articulate and uh, I'll try to somehow communicate truthfully about you know what we had achieved with this plan and what we thought at least as a uh, group you know, we've done to make significant changes even before uh, the August date that was spoken of. So the 3E plan, we'll go into why it was written, the Coleman report, why it was, why it was written. We'll talk about some of the action items that were mentioned. Uh, the 3E author's perspective, I think you've heard some of that, but uh, we have a slide that may encompass some of those perceptions. Uh, some of the strategic initiatives that we've done as an organization either before or doing this process are delineated here as well. And, and then the Racing Culture Task Force, obviously where we are today uh, in the presentation of this uh, as, at, I should say on behalf of this committee. Can you advance the slide please? Okay, 3E's goal again was to bring forth some awareness of use of force issues. Some of the things were talked about, some of the uh, shootings that have happened, police related officer involved shootings, uh, taser death, and our general use of force, not to mention the Jackie Craig incident, uh, is something more recently that we've dealt with. Our Coleman report dealt with the internal issues within the department, some of the uh, inequities, so to speak, some of the uh, 
potential discriminatory conduct that police supervisors had engaged in and what our response to that was. So the final three action items as stated, as stated here incorporate uh, some of those answers to potential problems or goal and action items uh, put forth. And again, recommendations from this group as well. Please forward it. Okay, as I just said, the taser deaths, uh, our clergy members here that felt that officers weren't adequately trained to work with citizens. Uh, there is a, there was a concern and is still an ongoing concern among members of this board about the level of communication that we, they should receive pursuant to an incident that happens in the city. All right, we, uh, we did come together at least for this group and the coalition in, in particular came together because there was a need, the unit, there was a need for them to unif uniformly approach the city. And I think it was described with Mr. Daniels and the former, uh, the former city manager made it possible for that to happen and they were brought to the table to construct the original 3E action plan. So you can forward, back. You can forward the uh, slide. We all know that three action authors, action plan authors, they are seated here. There is a tremendous amount of respect and experience for each one of these individuals in the city. So what they say matters. What, what they say matters to me, I should say, also here. Um, communication was an issue and we are working. That is a work in progress. But uh, that should not take away the hard work that this agency has done uh, between 2014 and now. So the three plan is a starting point. I say it as well as each one of the individuals here, we have decided on it as a living document. So that is something that we live in this department and something that we pledge to push forward. Please advance it. Uh, some of this is just a regurgitation of information you've already heard, so I'll ask you to forward that slide. Uh, you can forward the slide again. Here's feedback. Uh, some of this was spoken to earlier. Uh, the, the authors of the plan did convey that they were disenchanted with the implementation of the plan and the communication from the office of the chief. I can tell you that, again, uh, some of those concerns manifested themselves during the course of this. We've talked, uh, and sometimes an, in an animated manner, about whether we have actually uh, made progress or not. Again, I think as we go forward, you'll see that so there was progress made and uh, there was some, on our part, some acknowledgement of the fact that perhaps either progress was not made in certain categories or that mistakenly we viewed progress as being something that was not ongoing and we came to an agreement with members of the group that we would look at things as ongoing issues and not closed out problems. I think that's fair to say. Can we move the slide forward? The Coleman report, I've touched on this already. The main thing were allegations of discriminatory conduct within the police department. Some of you may remember also the snowman incident that was a part of this. Uh, some of the members, as a matter of fact, that were complainants in regards to this plan are some really big supporters within the police department of the changes that we've made so far. You can forward it. Here are the facts. Members of the Fort Worth PD complained they've been subjected to race-based discrimination and they hired an outside investigator, Coleman and Associates, to conduct an internal study. Please forward it. Uh, Coleman, as we said, identified issues. This is just a breakdown. One is a first-line supervisor in the department. The second was a second-line supervisor. And the third was an officer, actually, of the Fort Worth Black Police Officers Association. Forward, please. The Coleman report determined that there was tangential evidence of discrimination. So organizational behavioral concerns, which I can attest to are a concern and are things that we have dealt with as an agency. Uh, just so recently as putting forth a new transfer policy that I included in some of the three action items that I presented to each one of the gentlemen here, detailing how we look at the internal transfer process and tried to make it just based upon the demographics of our city. Okay, the behavior is inconsistent with departmental policies and guidelines existed and the Coleman recommendations, as you see here, have been addressed and the Chief's continuing to review and monitor. Perhaps that should be changed to just, we have agreed that there are ongoing issues still at hand. Forward, please. So there were 31 recommendations divided into four categories, as uh, Dr. Bell stated. Those four categories, police encounters with citizens, police response to critical incidents, police plan for increasing the diversity, within the department and the specific Coleman recommendations. So 
again, we worked with each author to, to work on each of these issues, which you'll see as we go forward. Please advance. So the strategic initiatives. One of our initiatives has been the open community forums up around the city. Many of you I've either seen or met at some of these different community uh, forums that we've had. Literally, we've had forums that have had 10 people and forums that have had 100 people. But nonetheless, we see the importance of opening ourselves up to a in meaningful interaction with members of our community. I think that uh, this is something that we could agree upon happened well before any of the incidents happened since I've been the police chief. That's something that, as uh, Dr. Bell mentioned, I mentioned during my interview process that it was important to work with members of the community and to listen. So uh, that was something that occurred well before we engaged in to our discussions. So recognizing the importance of developing relationships with the community is something that, that I'm dedicated to, but it's internal and external because as we've met with people in the community, we've also had community forums, in particular the chief's forums with members of our internal department employees. So they hope they happen as frequently as our external meetings. The key items in addressing the actions that we saw in the 3E e Coleman report were procedural justice, body-worn camera policies, use of force and use of force matrix changes and de-escalation training, which uh, I think marries with this plan very well. Please forward. The National Initiative for Building Community and Trust. I actually have a separate slide for that. Uh, upon my hire, I was asked if we would be interested in participating in a national initiative with the Bureau of Justice um, with the three uh, topics in mind. That's enhancing procedural justice within the department and reducing the incidents of implicit bias and fostering reconciliation with the community. I think we can all agree that we're in certain stages of this. I don't know which stages we might, as a group here, uh, say that we're in, but I think you'll find that, again, the police department has been proactive in foreseeing that there is possible community problems and also now having worked in, with the National Initiative to try to bring the community together with the police department. So procedural justice, the definition, it's basically our interaction with the public and how much confidence the public has in the police department. All right, they, what we do right now shapes our interactions with the community. However, as a police department and as a police officer, I may not have been in Selma, but I have to take on the fact that now as a police officer, that happened to folks. And this is something that we have to communicate up, down, and across the agency. So you can imagine if I am a kid from rural northern Texas who's not dealt with people like myself from Philadelphia who are animated and speak very loud or speak very quickly, that could be perceived as a problem. We have to train our officers now to understand that not only do they sometimes represent something they had nothing to do with years ago, but they also represent now how we are going to act and react to members of our community that may not look, walk, or talk like us. Evidence uh, has shown that procedural justice perceptions can have a significant impact on public safety. So uh, again, it was so important that my team at the time put together a team of people to teach procedural justice and to go out and liaise with the community to create better understandings as to why police do things and how to better engender community policing in the way that we do business. You can forward. Our officer-worn body cameras were an important component to the members of this board and to me for making sure that not only do we tell the story internally the best way we can, but we, we keep everybody honest with the body camera. It has been an, a problem for us to work through mandatory body camera wear. That problem is a resistance that I got from our police officers association. However, we use the state statute, excuse me, the state statute now to govern our body camera use. We've moved towards purchasing equipment that will facilitate making it easier for the body cam to automatically act, activate. We've upgraded the body cams in our police cars and are upgrading equipment for each one of our patrol officers out there with the ultimate goal of having everyone from top to bottom in this organization wearing a body cam at all times. That updated general order, as you see, was done in July of 2007. The new discipline matrix was done at the same time. And uh, several iterations of the body camera policy had been done prior to our meetings. 
Uh, some of this is what I spoke to about the new auto activating cameras. Um, one other thing that's critical to mention is some of the cameras that we're buying now, I should say each camera that we're buying now, has the ability to when an officer or the car, basically an officer exits a vehicle, it automatically engages the use of the body cam. But the really great thing about this is it creates a bubble around that officer in that vehicle so that any other officer on the scene will automatically have their body cameras activated. I think it's a real benefit to not only the citizens, but the police officer, again, of being able to tell what the story was in any given event that happens out in the street. You can follow it. Axon's also developing a Bluetooth holster that we'll be uh, testing. So when an officer disengages his firearm from his holster, uh, that would give a wi wireless activation and activate the body camera. And we'll also, there's also advances where that will activate on the CAD screen and show that that officer has uh, taken his holster, well, taken his gun out of his holster. Uh, tasers are being upgraded with new batteries, so that will also capture the event when an officer unholsters a taser, the body cam, or I should say the taser will do part of the, uh, the taping as well. The escalation training, perhaps the biggest training uh, advance that we've had in the last two years, perhaps in quite some time, the de-escalation training, we brought in uh, the Police Executive Research for Forum to teach our officers how to best handle situations or crises when a gun is not involved, even if someone has a knife or some other object or an, off or an officer comes upon somebody with possibly a mental distress, how can we best handle the situation by de-escalating, bringing that situation down and, and hoping that we have a happy ending for everyone involved. Uh, I think we can all agree that that's a necessary component of the soft skills that officers should have every day. And this training was done from top to bottom in this organization. That means I took it, every officer uh, from top to bottom had to take part in de-escalation training. It was difficult. There were some difficult conversations. Uh, officers asked why we have to take this training. Aren't we doing it already the right way? Well. Some of, some of us are, but for the portion of us that are not, they are now held to a different standard, and that is one where de-escalation is written into actually our policy and use of force. So our use of force policy was not only redone, but de-escalation was placed in the policy as a means by which we can achieve safe results in handling citizens that are in crises. We can, we can move it on. This is just a description of some of the uh, topics in the de-escalation training. Um, gives you some some important phrases here we use a critical decision making model uh, it's just talking about some of the things again reducing the need to use deadly force we'd like to mitigate as much as we can the instance that an officer may have to apply deadly force to any individuals out in our community there's six training models uh, I'll, I'll leave these to for you to read here the six training models again are each steps within the process that each officer had to take. And we will have refresher training and de-escalation every year so that officers are maintain their awareness of what's expected of them. In addition, uh, de-escalation training is now a part of the mandatory training within the police academy. So we won't have to worry about you know, retraining our, our academy recruits in de-escalation. That will be something that they uh, graduate with. And I should mention, uh, we've gone so far as to now, as of, what would you say, Charlie, uh, early 2017, place body cameras on each one of our academy recruits to reduce the uh, reluctance of our academy recruits to engage their body-worn cameras. We're now outfitting our recruits with those cameras while they're in the academy. Again, another step in the direction of making this is another critical piece of equipment that we give you. We give you a gun, we give you other things to use on this cool looking belt, but we want you to use that body worn camera to, to keep you out of trouble and to keep, it, keep the story straight from everyone involved. And we found that since we put this policy in place, we've actually had some better compliance with our use of force policies. Uh, tactical pause has been a big thing. Some of the resistance that I've received from the Police Officers Association in particular is that uh, some believe that taking a tactical moment and evaluating the situation may put an officer in harm's way. I disagree. 
I think that part of being a police officer is being able to communicate, and I mentioned earlier having the soft skills to work on a situation and to, to bring that situation down or de-escalate. And uh, I think that's an expectation that we can place on each one of the people we put in uniform and put a badge on in this city. Quite, we, we know that there's going to be instances where we have to use force. There's no doubt. But we can ask people to do so safely and effectively. And this training has given them some of the tools that they need to do it. We can move on. Uh, so next steps here, uh, other than coming and, and having this presentation today, we are, we've pledged to have ongoing communication with the members of the board here. We'll also use more data to uh, drive what we do as an organization. One thing that the gentleman here didn't mention is that we formed the policy advisory board. That policy advisory board has brought them up to speed on many of the things we've done policy-wise between the time I was hired and now that uh, really educated them on some of the, the actual changes we've made in this department. So, like Ms. Washington has said, there's some communication issues. There's, there's no way around that. The, but the bottom line is uh, we cannot allow someone to purport that there has not been changes. There have been changes. And we've changed proactively, not reactively. We've changed the uh, transgender policy. We've changed other things that we've had no problems with over the course of the last two years. So we're very you know, much on the cusp of changing things prior to to needing them or prior to being told that we have to change them. Another thing you should know is that we're in the process of TPCA recognition. Our Police Chiefs Association is, uh, we've made an application to be recognized as one of the top agencies in Texas. Uh, in order to do that, we have to go through a rigorous auditing process and we will be, if accredited, the largest police agency in Texas that have that accreditation. That's something to be very proud of for our police officers. So we don't always do it all wrong. We don't do it all right all the time, but we're not wrong all the time either. And we are proactive about making sure that you can be proud of this police department and you can be proud of the young men and women that put this uniform on. So I thank you. Yes, Mr. Sanders. Quick question. I know this time is running out. Uh, but the Coleman report talked specifically about the culture in the department at the time under the former chief. Uh, particularly that black officials within the department were ridiculed and discriminated against by white officials in the department. Would you say the majority of Hispanic and black police officers would agree with you that that culture has changed? I think so. Uh, I think one of the one of the big tells was just last week at our at our city council meeting where the Hispanic Police Officers Association president and the BPOA president stood up and endorsed our, our foray into having the commander's positions. Um, yeah, we can, we're gonna have ups and, ups and downs. We're not gonna agree all the time. And sometimes we'll just flat out agree to disagree. But the lines of communication are open. And I don't think that our Black Police Officers Association or our NLAO, our Latino Officers Association, would uh, say that the conditions are not better. And what about your relationship with those, I'm going to say, white police officers association? Well, listen, there's no white police officers association. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a POA, and there are members of that POA that are black, Latino, Asian. Uh, my relationship with that association has been rocky, to, to say the least. And I wouldn't come up and tell you anything different. Have I received resistance? I have. Do I have people in the POA that have endorsed or, or look forward to some of the changes that I've made? I have that as well. So I just look to keep working with the association. I'll never change the fact that I'm going to press forward and make this agency one of the best agencies in the country. And I'll do that with the help of the association or without. One last quick question. How many sections of the department have no African Americans in couldn't I have to get you that number, but there are several sections that have no African Americans in them. Including homicide and SWAT? You're absolutely right. There was a officer in SWAT, but he was recently transferred from SWAT. And why do you suppose that is? I think that in the past that there may have been a inequity in the actual process of interviewing people for specialty positions. Again, I spoke to a change that I made and one of the changes is now in the specialty position selection process, 
we are expected to put a board together that is uh, diverse and to reflect the diversity of this community. And it is my hope that that selection committee will now pick the best people possible and we will see a change in the diversity of certain special units. Chief, just a couple, just a couple of questions, real quick. Real quick, I know we got to go, Miss Navajo. But that the audio piece, will it work on these cameras, or does it have to be activated? Because in Mr. Craig's case, the audio piece was the most important thing missing. Yes, the the newest equipment has audio working as well. Um, I I can't account for some of the problems electronically. I mean, we, of course, we're going to have problems just like anywhere else because this this equipment's new. The automatic equipment that's coming on is a is a new version, but we'll work through the kinks and make sure that it all works fine. The shotguns as well. You know, I that's a that's a good question. I would have to get back to you. To, to, yes. And, and finally, I, I just and I know we got to go, but to say that this is not being reactive. I looked at all of the dates of these implementations, and they are extremely recent. So it would lead us to believe July of 2017. I think I saw all of them were 2017. The earliest was 2016. Would lead us to believe that some of these are proactive. I mean, reactive vice pro. Some of the things that were placed on this slide are 2016 and 2017. I can tell you this: that there are changes. The transgender policy changed in the the first few months that I was here, and I was hired in late 2015. So we have proactively made changes, and I think that the gentlemen here that have been exposed to some of our policy changes in the policy advisory capacity will be able to support that, the ones that have attended these meetings. Chief, first, right. and, yes. right Chief, first and foremost, to you and your officers, thank you very much for what you do for the community. We may agree or disagree on one instance or another, but it's your job that you that all of you are out there are uh, putting your lives on the line to protect yeah. all of us. So first and foremost, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I, I have a, a process question. I read the interim status report from the uh, Truth and Justice. It was written in October. And I'm very happy to see that all the officers are undergoing training, 16 hours of training. But can you tell me, please tell us, who is doing that training? How were they chosen? And what specific modules? I saw the six modules up there. But what specific, who is doing it? How were they chosen? And how are the officers receiving it? Actually, the, uh, the officers that were initially assigned to the procedural justice training division were selected by the former assistant chief. Uh, we got behind this and realized that we needed specific people that had the core competencies to, to relate this information to the 1600, 1700 pounds plus officers that we had. It is a, uh, how can I put it? Yeah. It is a daunting task to, um, to facilitate the procedural justice training. Our, you have to have the right people in that room. And we had some really good people in that room, and now we've even brought the former police officer association the president, the president on board. We brought in a retired police officer as well to help facilitate some of these training sessions and our community sessions. Um, it, it's difficult. I, 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 I have no doubt, but who's training the trainers? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, we, we sent our trainers to uh, Chicago and other places across the country to receive their procedural justice certification. So they've been not only training across the country, but they have now gone to other places in the country and have trained and facilitated training for other departments. So the National, uh, the National Institute, they, they actually have created a training program. We have uh, weekly phone calls with the members of that, uh, of the members of the actual, you know, the national initiative. And the training, you know, doesn't stop at them. It, you know, I have to attend sessions, or Assistant Chief Ramirez will attend sessions. And then what we learn, we bring back and help integrate into our training program. Thank you. Chief, I have a, a question in relation to body cam. My wife's a police officer at a different department. When body cam evidence is available, that department, they make it available immediately. In the Jacqueline Craig incident, why was there such a long delay when there was cell phone evidence? I know what the, the DA's office, would, would, Robert, would, Sharon Wilson would say when there's an investigation. Why can't it be released immediately 
we're seeing the point of view of Jacqueline Craig. It's there. We know he has a body cram. Why can't that be released immediately? Oh, in that instance, we had juveniles involved in that. So that was a, a big hang up in that. I mean, legally. I mean, that, that, there's no statute that says anything about juveniles. Oh, yes. Yes, sir, there is. What statute is that? So there's, there, there are two issues here. Name the statute. We I want you to name the statute. I'll find it for you and send it to you, and I, it won't take long, but there are two issues here. The first issue is that a police officer was involved. And under the statute that passed in 2015, when a police officer is involved in an incident, you cannot release the body cam until the end of the investigation, the, what, what they call the procedure. <coughs> so, who was in support of that? Was the city of Fort Worth Police Department in support of that statute in, in Austin? I, That's ridiculous. We did, not, we did not actively support or oppose that statute. Chief, are you in support of that? I, I follow the law. Uh, no, 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 no. Are you in support of that? I'm going to follow the law. Okay. Yes. Well, you know, interracial marriage was illegal at one time. Would you have followed that? Please answer that question. I'm actually in an interracial. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was illegal at one time. No. Okay. So, are you in support of it? Yes, Am I in support of releasing a video? Exactly. That, that's a case. Just because case. something is the law does not mean it's right. Now, what I'm saying is, is, you know, I know you don't have to answer these questions, but just in the court of law, but you are being judged. Okay. So, are you in support? I will tell you that on a case by case basis, I do think that body cam footage should, could be released. We have released okay. body cam footage. Well, that, in the past. That's what I want to know. So. Yeah. Why was there a delay? If it can be because, released, because but the there was a child there. Again, yes. If, if the parent sounds away, you say this. No, I'm, I'm the, just the second part of that is under the Public Information Act, juvenile records are confidential, and so the parent cannot. The city, the government entity, there's no provision that allows us to get a waiver to release it. However. If a parent makes that request, a parent is entitled to it, and the parent does, and the parent can decide on their own to release it once they are had once they had it. Wow. Here it was the it was two issues. Number one, there were juvenile records, but number two, there was still a police officer that was being investigated, and because of that, we it you had these two simultaneous things going. So even if we could have released it to the parent. We still have this investigation, and without the AG giving the Attorney General giving us guidance, we didn't know which one took precedent. So Did we you ask? Said, yes, sir. We sent it to the Attorney General, and when the Attorney General told us that we could release the records to the parent, we released the records to the parent. Let me understand this. But by that time, one, one thing. We, so yes, if Jacqueline Craig had asked that body cam to be released, even though there was an investigation of the police officer. She did. You're telling me it would have been released to Jackson Craig? That, Mr. Mr. Session, like um, a meeting yeah, would have. I understood. I'm just, I'm, I'm just Jacqueline fine. Craig, if she had asked for that body cam to be released, you all would have released it to her, irrespective of there being a investigation with Mr. Mark. Our normal policy is that we would still submit it to the Attorney General's office, say that these are juvenile records, but we believe that this meets an exception, and get the Attorney General to confirm that that exception has been met and allow us to make that release. You do know that the Attorney General has 180 days to respond to any uh, request for an Attorney General. You all should, should that's public information. We would certainly consider looking at it, but let me just tell you from our standpoint, that puts us in a very precarious position litigation-wise. If we release the juvenile record to somebody who purports to be the parent without being able to, or another agency, without us being able to um, confirm, this part probably would not have been that difficult, and so if we could have, we would have released it. Again, it was the other issue that was involved in this. Sometimes if we are, if we completely know that this is the parent, we'll go ahead and release it. Sometimes we still may go to the AG office to ask for the key. It just depends. Do, what do you, how do you verify the parent? Do you clearly know? That show me your birth certificate? It could be that. Okay, what I'm saying, this is, that's laborious. And that's, that's, that's disheartening to hear that the city is purposely putting these stumbling blocks there that it's there. She had the cell phone. Why was it not released? I don't want to hear Again, it. I think case, the next, next session, 
I Whoever, think in this the, case, the reason why it was not immediately released, because we could have verified that it was that she was a parent, was that we still had the police officer issue. And without any guidance from the Attorney General's office, we didn't know, we could not know, if the fact that she was the parent basically overcame the fact that a police officer was still being investigated. So until the Attorney General could say to us, yes, it's okay to release to her, even though this police officer is being investigated, we could not release that and, um, and believe that we were complying with all the components of the law. My sister was the city attorney for the city of Austin for 10 years. Sure. And they had plenty of incidents. And they chose to be proactive. Get it out there. We know what happened. We're not covering it. You can still do an investigation with the body, with public opinions still out there. That's that's just my my my. Uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop this conversation. We've got two more briefings to go through, uh, so appreciate the passion. But uh, Chief Fitzgerald, uh, line number on eight talks about the briefing of the National Initiative of Building Community Trust and Justice. The Chief's report left me warm and feely inside tonight, and I just wanted to know the opinion of you guys. Is is these successes and and advances of of the 3 a plan, is it yay or nay? We have to get that. From our perspective, there are no advances because we have not seen anything put in practice. That's what we're waiting on. And to answer your question, it would have been healthy for us to have those conversations together about what should be released and what should be released because Ministers Against Crime, the local organizing committee, and these other groups are here to help us, not to destroy us. So thank you for the passion. Thank you, Reverend. The, the, the other question, the other issue is this, is that the, uh, as the Chief has said, uh, if, if we agree that this is ongoing, nothing has been uh, done but as uh, Valerie Washington says, we hope it'll be done. And and a lot of times while we're hoping uh, I said some things have been yeah. done. Some things have been done. I'm not attacking you, Valerie. I just want to make sure because it's not attacking you. I'm not attacking you. And you want me to, I can't. But the bottom line on this is that what's going on is this is that the the policy review board. That was a, this is all I want to say, that was a community uh, advisory board. The community advisory board was diverse. That was, uh, uh, they met in an auditorium on El Paso Street. There were many people. The policy review board, I attended it. As the chief said, great information. It would have been better if, it, if they had continued to have a more diverse Racial ethnic uh, uh, ethnic uh, board that was a little bit more that was more diverse, uh, faith community wise and all as the community advisory board. Hopefully that's where it's going. Okay, I'm, uh, again uh, due to time because it's already going to be we're past our time. Um, let, okay, one more comment and then Chief Fitzgerald comes up. I, I want to say this because I think it's uh, it's necessary that. Uh, we have agreed to accept ongoing. That's right. And so, so that's right. To, to ask us if it's been put in place, that's an answer to your question. It is ongoing. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, Thank you, Mr. Chief Fitzgerald, please. Well, I'll be regurgitating the same information here, which is the procedure of justice. Go a little fast. I'll, I'll okay. be very quickly for you. Yeah. All right. We'll do this. These are members of some members of our team that we deal with, uh, just, you know, not only in the federal government, but the universities that are working with us uh, to make sure we have significant achievement in our procedural justice and national initiative training. Uh, a Yale Law School professor here, uh, Tracy Mears, in conjunction with the Chicago PD, facilitated our training. So that's the training that I believe the rabbi asked for, the training that uh, we sent our folks to. So in essence, this is uh, in keeping with the President's task force of 21st century policing, the unification of the academic and research into modern day policing. Uh, 
procedural justice a shortened definition as opposed to the definition I gave you earlier. So procedures used by police officers for citizens are treated fairly in the proper respect as human beings. I think that's a more succinct and more apropos definition. Our procedural justice one and two classes, it, procedural justice is given in a three-stage classroom environment. PJ1 and PJ2 have been completed by all members of this police department. We are now in the procedural justice three stage where we talk about decision making and how the brain influences what we do and why we do it. Uh, why we have implicit biases and such. Uh, this is a real critical piece to explaining to our officers why we make the decisions we do and to try to overcome some of the misgivings we may have. So officers are taught to recognize what inherent stereotypes and prejudices they may have and to uh, really take an inventory, so to speak, of their biases. So this training is ongoing. 650 of our 1,700 officers have got this training so far in 2017, and classes are ongoing. I believe I included the slide with our classes forward. So for example, in, this is 2017 in October. This is just one month worth of classes. This sort of message goes out to the entire police department, and we allow them to schedule when those classes will <coughs> be available to them, uh, or they will be available for the classes. But each one has to manage it. It's mandatory that they take these classes. So that is an example of a class announcement that goes out to each one of our police officers. Another thing I'll mention, it didn't get mentioned in the last the last discussion is another thing we change in our organization is all of our policies and procedures are tested. So our police officers, if they receive a change in policy or procedure, they're given that procedure electronically, and they have to take a test on that policy or procedure to demonstrate their understanding of it. This really helps us when there's changes made in wording to any specific policy, guess what that police officer has to do? Review that policy and discern where the changes are and be able to answer questions regarding those changes, whether they be SB4 related or anything that we that we have that we're attacking as a change that needs to be made within this department. They need to demonstrate proficiency. These are some of the community engagements. When we when I say community engagement is part of procedural justice three and our reconciliation process is doing just what we're doing now, having open and honest community conversations. I mentioned having community conversations already, but now with the backdrop of procedural justice training and having the knowledge that our officers have in procedural justice, we hope to make better inroads in each one of these uh, locations was an opportunity for our procedural justice trainers to go out and to interact with folks in the community and to convey to them what we've been doing and how we've done it. You can move that along. So the goal here is to keep it going. Like I said, all academy recruits will have to have procedural justice training as part of their, their nine months in the police academy. Uh, the reinforcement goes on not only as one the electronic module that I mentioned to you called Power DMS, but at roll call training. That means when police officers come into work every day, that a sergeant or lieutenant facilitates their roll call and reinforces the tenets of what we do as an organization and why procedural justice is part of what we do. So we prioritize what the principles are in procedural justice every day. As we move toward legitimacy, we all recognize this setting. Uh, one step in, on our way, along our way to being better as an organization, to being sympathetic and empathetic to members of the community, is having that dialogue with residents. We're dedicated to it, like I mentioned. We started it well before uh, anything noteworthy happened here, and we're going to continue doing it because open and honest communication is the only way we'll get through the tough times that we're seeing right now. So, um, I'm going to take every opportunity I can to stand before folks that are happy with us or not happy with us to create a sense of trust in this police department and in this city. So whether or not uh, I make everyone happy, I know that it's impossible to, to, for everyone to walk away from here happy, but I want most people to understand the takeaway here is that we're going to be dedicated to ongoing, as we said here, ongoing open and honest communication with all members of the community. I tried to be very succinct because it took up a lot of time for the last. Thank you. You have one more presentation. <laughs>
<laughs> and this is on uh, briefing on local enforcement and federal bill four concerning immigration. All right, I don't have a fancy deal. Hi, boy. Sorry about that, guys. I don't like pictures and stuff. I love pictures. Too. I'm Assistant Chief Charlie Ramirez, and I'm over at Personnel Finance. I have the opportunity to work on SB4. As you recall, uh, Governor Abbott signed this into law, and uh, it's SB4, Senate Bill 4, also called the Show Me Your Paper and Papers Law, or Show Me Your Papers Bill. And uh, when we first saw this, we were, we were concerned. And with that concern, uh, the chief of police, along with other major city chiefs throughout this state, got together and realized, you know, what, what is good, really going to be our response? Of course, we're going to follow state law. But this was an uh, unfunded mandate that was pushed down to us. And so as chiefs of police, as departments, we realized the impact it really can have on our community, uh, not only the Hispanic community, but all the other communities as well. And basically, in a nutshell, what is before did or told us, told cities, that we couldn't create a policy that would prohibit an officer from checking immigration status during maybe a, a car or a routine traffic stop. And so with that being said, we, as a department, uh, along with the city legal, along with Michelle's group, um, developed, uh, well, well first the, the chief order being uh, really pressed to create a new policy. This is an SB4 policy that was created. And even though the state law uh, tells us what we need to do with, with SB4, uh, we were able to work around a lot of things. So real quick in this policy, as far as enforcement, yes, we cannot prohibit our officers from asking any type of immigration status while they're on call. But what we did is create a policy so that we can track when and how the officer does that. And so that way if we have an audit or we can uh, pick out an individual officer who may be overusing this. So with this policy, we not only require the officer to call out on a, on a different call, we also have the officer have to create an incident report. If there's no offense report created, they have to call the supervisor to the scene if any action is taken. And with that, we're able to track any time and all time that is spent during this immigration uh, check. And so I can tell you as of September 1, if you remember, the injunction took place by Judge Garcia in San Antonio. Well, that was overturned, and it took away some of the punitive damages, our punitive and uh, potential uh, criminal fines for the chiefs and, and, of course, the elected officials. It took that out, but it still gave the officers right to do this. So moving forward, we thought it was important that we created a policy that did not restrict officers per se, but it did allow us as a police department to track and to be able to audit and to be able to make sure that encounters with our citizens are, are, are done properly. And with this, like I said, we created a policy that I think is a model policy. And I think we did our due diligence working not only with our city legal, but working with Michelle group to make sure we get this information out. And what was great is we really moved forward. We got this information out. We created, with help of Michelle's group, these pamphlets. We got five different pamphlets in English and in Spanish. And basically, it tells you what it's before it is, what your rights are, what you can do to report if you think you're being even racially profiled. But it, it answers every question you have. And so, Michelle, just, man, how many did you, you made so many? We, we gave most of them away, so we're going to have to record some. So every chance we get, every opportunity we have, we're handing these out. And again, we trained our neighborhood police officers, or NPOs. We trained our supervisors. Like the chief said, we put this online for the officers, and they had to be tested for this policy. As of yesterday, running the stats to see if this, if any officer has done this, we have zero calls when it comes to immigration stats. We're not federal immigration officers, and officers know that. Our job as local law enforcement is to make sure the citizens, visitors, and people who come and visit the city of Fort Worth are safe. And we're available for, to answer calls for service. With an immigration check, it can take up to two to three hours before a federal agent comes down and takes custody of these individuals. We've always had the ability to do detainers. We've always had the ability to check immigration status when we take someone to jail on class B and above. Are you violent? Criminals. We've always had that ability to do that through 287G, which is another program through ICE that we do. 
And that allows us, when we bring in a known offender, we run their fingerprints, we run their names, and we see if they have to take it, or they should be deported. We've always had the ability to do that. We don't want our, our state, you know, criminals in, in, the, in the community. What this does is just, it, it opens it up a little bit more. Like I said, we created a policy that I think is a really model policy. We've had other jurisdictions ask us for this policy, and we're gladly sending out anybody we, we can. Because, unfortunately, the way Fort Worth is active, actively addressing this before may not be the same what other jurisdictions are doing. It may not be the same with what the county are going to be doing. But we have, we made this policy available, and, and we really realized the impact, what it could have. And in some cities it has, like Houston, where they're seeing under under report of certain um, groups who feel like they can't report. And so this is one of the reasons these pamphlets are important to us, because it really tells you in our policy and in the law, if you're a victim of crime, you don't check in with immigration status. If you're a witness to a crime, we're not checking immigration status. And basically that tells you your rights in these pamphlets, in our, our policy. So again, that's kind of it in, in a nutshell. Um, I can provide you with the actual Senate bill if you want. I can provide you with the actual policy. And of course, we have handouts for each and every one of you. And we can make these handouts available to any groups, uh, any meetings you may have. We're more than willing to get out in front of anybody and explain what our role is gonna be when it comes to SB4. Because again, we, we are here to serve the community regardless of who you are. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the information. Um, have you seen, as you mentioned, Houston has already seen decline in certain types of reports. How are we doing? Actually, great question, because once the Houston chief called me and asked it, I ran my stats, and we've increased our, um, our uh, yeah, yeah, it's not a good thing, but it, it did decrease. We basically see um, non-English-speaking, uh, Spanish-speaking, uh, those reports are on a rise, and so um, it, it's a good thing, because I think for the last 20 years, we've been doing community policing, we've been reached now and saying, you know, we involve them, and you know, we do have, you know, Spanish citizen police academies, all in Spanish, we have uh, citizen groups, code blue groups, all in Spanish, and they patrol on the radio in Spanish. And so those are the groups that are getting out to get the word out, let them know that we, you know, we are we are here for them. And we don't care about immigration status when we're taking a report. We don't care about immigration status when they want to report something to, to the police department. Hey. But we have, we, we have our own um, When a Fort Worth police officer arrests someone and takes them to the jail, the sheriff is in charge of the jail, is that correct? Yeah, the sheriff is in charge of and the sheriff has after, a contract after, with ICE. Well, after the intake, we got the initial intake, so we get them, we process them in our jail, and then they get transferred to Mansfield. From Mansfield, once the case is accepted through the, the DA's office or Tarrant County, then it's their responsibility once they accept that charge. So, yes, they ultimately end up in Tarrant County, but from our initial hold, from our initial port, um, we run them if they don't show a detainer. Um, they're not put on hold. They're basically there because of the charge, whether it be DWI, theft, or whatever. But we we wouldn't run anybody through our uh, unless they have a detainer that's already down for someone for PI. We would not normally run someone for for shot public intoxication. Public, right. public, so the minor offenses, it's the class being above. Or they have a, a, a detainer already that we would hold them on. So again, we do the initial um, arrest, we do the initial intake, um, and if there's no hold or anything like that, they're they're free to go once they post bond or are made bail, just like anybody else. And and I realize this is the city of Fort Worth, and we're a task force of the city of Fort Worth, but it sure would be useful to have the sheriff come talk to us about how they're interacting. I mean, because our our police department have the best policies in the world. If they're going to end up in a county jail where the sheriff has a very lucrative contract with ICE to deal with immigration issues, there's we're bumping up against some hard stuff there that might be helpful for this task force to learn more about. Chief Fitzgerald, do you have any comments on that on how you're working with the sheriff currently? Uh, we, cur we have a good relationship with the sheriff. Uh, I cannot speak for him as to whether he attend the meeting, I could only ask. Uh, but I will say this, the backbone of our policy relating to SB4 is about one thing, and 
is making sure that we do not engage in racial profiling. That's the bottom line. So, you know, I don't care. You mentioned interracial marriages, everything else earlier today. But I, I can tell you, my, <laughs> wife, my wife got stopped coming through customs, coming back from vacation last year, and was not pleased with being stopped. And, uh, you know, it's something that touches us all in many, many different ways. And the objective, uh, when we sat down and really wanted to carve out not just something to deal with SB4, but to deal with uh, stops in general. That means if someone's in a car, if someone's walking, I want every officer to be able to justify why that person is being stopped. It's not enough that we have a video camera. We need written justification. And if that deters people from engaging in racial profiling, so be it. But the byproduct of it is that we don't engage in racial profiling and we're not sending unnecessary people back that are undocumented. Uh, we, we have a, you know, we want to make sure that we still get the reports. I think we're doing a really good job as, as, as the Chief Ramirez mentioned. We're not seeing uh, a decrease in the reporting. Sure, there's been one-offs where somebody said that they, you know, would have called had they not been illegal. Yes, we've had that. However, the, the reports are going up, and um, that says that our, that our community has some degree of trust in what we're doing and how we're pushing this forward. Did the city council ask you before the chief uh, SB4, did they ask y'all what was, do you even understand the law? Um, no, no, we, what happened was we knew the legislature, we knew from the legislature that this was possibly coming down. So we started working very early on, uh, diligently to ensure that we had a policy that was our own, that was something that could deal with the unique nuances of, of what SB4 means to, to everyone in the community. So, uh, you know, we weren't guided or told. We got on this, you know, really, really fast and really early, and we worked with Letitia and people from legal to make sure that we were dotting the I's and crossing the T's because as it reads, you know, police chiefs and, you know, sheriffs and people can be fined and imprisoned. You know, that's, what, that's how it came out. However, I'm not gonna sacrifice, you know, putting someone out there that would engage in racial, racial profiling and that would inconvenience or really break up a family or someone's life in this city. I don't think it's worth it. So our crux, and I'm, I'm emphasizing it, is we don't want officers engaging in racial profiling. And that's our stance on this, and that's the way we're dealing with any SB4 related context. Assistant Chief Ramirez, so if they have an active warrant that's not an issue, like maybe a mother with three kids, but just a son just got assaulted, that has an active warrant, and all of a sudden that becomes a part of the play of the entire scenario. So they don't have to worry about that. Well, that, depending on what the active warrant is, if they have a robbery warrant traffic. or something like that, if it's a traffic ticket, no, we wouldn't be asking that. Oh, wow. If, if they are a, we need uh, to, a witness or a victim of the crime, because the law, SB4, the law itself stipulates that we cannot ask immigration status on that. And that way, that, that wouldn't prevent someone from calling, fearing that they're going to be checked. So our policy, prohibits that that part but again it's, it's it's again holding those officers accountable and making sure and if there is a check then it's documented why and so again if they do they have to call out they have to notify the supervisor the supervisor will make a scene so again we, we made sure we put those things in place i think we, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you but that's a real important caveat to what we're doing hey supervisors don't always get it right we know that but in this instance we have a uh, we have a caveat in our policy that says we have to, if an officer is making that type of inquiry, pursuing to some type of uh, you know, immigration issue that they need to call a supervisor to see. Uh, I think that that's a, a step in the direction of ensuring that that officer is not engaged in any type of racial profile. Are you working with the Fort Worth ISD to get this information out? Uh, yeah, matter of fact, we have, we made several events, uh, I think PTAs, of course our NPOs are really pushing out. I know Michelle's group was going out and they're doing their thing with Fort Worth ISD as well. So, so we, we continue, I mean like, you know, anybody that needs any information, we have it. We're willing to make any uh, meetings, any church, any group that we're, we're, we're wants to do it. We met, we've been actively pushing this out every day it was, it was created. And again, we, we knew it was coming down. She directed us to get something in place, and we had it ready, September 1, ready to go. Luckily, the introduction took place, and so we rolled it out a little bit later. But again, working with the city and working with other folks to get this out, it was very important to us. And, and 
matter of fact, we, we uh, have Daniel Segura, who is our, one of our uh, officers for the Hispanic community. He's been pushing that out uh, since the get-go. Thank you. Daniel has done a great job. Good job. Any other questions? On just, SB4? I just wanted to put on the record, uh, based on your, your question, Mr. Sessions, about the chief was one of many chiefs across the state of Texas that even before the law went into place, before the statute was uh, approved in Austin, was signed a letter with other chiefs across the state, the state um, against SB4 because it was already going to challenge, it was going to add additional challenges to their, their difficult jobs. So I just wanted that. I go to Austin okay. quite a, this is a good policy. I like this. I go to Austin every session. You got to show up. Mm -hmm. Just show up down there. Just show up. Just show up. But this is a good policy. I, I, this is really good. And we're also I, I'm sorry, Ms. Jennifer. I was, I was really being facetious. I, I was, I was, I was, my question was facetious. Is there a video of this that you share and explain it? For those who can't yeah, read, just that good that we're actually working on a video for for um, that would get the information out very short and succinct, so that people don't have to read through the brochure. So we've tried to hit, you know, the rap card, which has English and Spanish together, and then the other two that have a little bit more detailed information. But the video is our next is our next project that we're working with PD on. Yeah, well. And again, you know, getting. Uh, the more they get the information out, and now that you all have that information, if you all can share that information with your communities, that would be uh, you know, an added value for all of us so that we can get that. Uh, so the citizens know, and it's not just the minority markets that need to know, it's all markets that need to know, because if somebody sees something happening to someone else, they need to know what the law says. Well, and one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you, Charlie. Well, you're welcome. If anybody needs me to speak to a group or something, I'll be more than willing to come out there. And trust me, he will. I've used him many times. <laughs> thank you, Joe. Thank, thank you again for being here with us and sharing this information. Uh, we appreciate all the service and uh, the leadership that you provided for the city of Fort Worth. Thank you, Hey, Charles, how are you about to leave? Um, going on uh, to Long Map 10, just to let you know of all the future meetings that we have. I'm not going to read them because you all can read them yourselves. Uh, so I'm just going to go on to the closing remarks. And I do want to bring up, we talked a little bit about maybe changing some of the things that we're doing in the process of these community conversations. And I just want to touch on those. Y'all asked for more time hall meetings. Um, going out to the community centers uh, and meeting the communities there where they live. Uh, a workshop on uh, white privilege, defining the terms on that. Uh, when people sign up, we need to respond to them a little bit more timely. Uh, and I think uh, Reverend Woody is already on. He had mentioned that. And then I know that NLC is doing some leadership training with the City of Fort Worth, uh, Mayor and Council, and some of the uh, upper staff. So, you know, we will work on these things and looking at timelines and so forth uh, so that we can ensure that we do hear from every uh, citizen that wants to have a voice in this topic. It is important for all of us. We've all said we don't want to put a band aid on the issue. We really want to work to make some change and some good recommendations. Thanks, really good. To Thanks so much. And not have something to shelf on the on the wall there, uh, along with other policies and procedures that may have been done in the past. That's not what we're wanting to do here. Okay, do you have questions? Um, we talked about future meetings, the third Monday of each month from January through July. The third Monday in January is Martin Luther King Day, I believe. Chief. Are we going to be meeting that day or are we going to be I don't, think good honor. Honor. I don't think we will. I don't know. Yeah. No, we well, will change that. We will okay. change that. Yeah. Yeah. We will take a look at that. But it would be a good way to honor him. It would be, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, and again, if you all have comments, uh, and since you've all been participating with these community conversations, and you're wanting to see a change in the process, let us know because you know we don't know what we don't know. And if you're out there in those community conversations, you're here and things, y'all need to be able to communicate that to us. And you don't have to wait until the task force meeting. Uh, send an email. We're all good at sending emails, so that reply all, so we can all get it. Just real quick, and I've been too vocal this week. But however, I did 
my concern was that we would develop subcommittees where about a little Okay, and we would address that. We would address that. Yes. Okay. We are, but I just want the agenda from there to come off. Yeah. Because we're, uh, we're going to get together to, find, to define those task force, those committees. But yeah, we had talked about that in our last co chair meeting. So you guys are doing a great job. All right. Uh, I want to ask my fellow co chairs. Yeah, I I'd love to have a closing comment. I really? just had a couple of comments. Um, your input, you know, you're here for a reason because of your position in the community. And, and, and just bring those inputs in and don't don't hold back on those. You know, because you're out, you're out and about and you've been attending these community conversations. I would ask though that everybody remember that this is the beginning and most of us have never done this type of thing before. So we're all learning as we go. Uh, the feedback that we got today will significantly change the structure. And that's what we need. We need to feel comfortable that we're bringing information to this group and that we're addressing it in a way that makes all of you part of this conversation and a part of the solutions. We don't want to be too fast, though, because all we are doing is following what somebody else came up with. So if you jump out and you take you take a, a stand now that this is what needs to be done based on what? Based on somebody else's discussion. So let's give ourselves enough time to collect information. Make sure that it represents these 23 people and then take it forward with NASA's action National Plans. As Barbara said earlier, the committees will be formed, uh, but we have to have enough to see how do we categorize what we're gonna be working on. You have to be able to put it under a header and then this thing so you know what you're working on. So thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, yeah, I had my big show. I thought this was a good final meeting. And as we were saying, the questions don't stop in this room. I mean, I still have questions, but I will be getting to the chief that I'll share with you because there are a lot, there are a lot of issues just dealing with the police department, much less all the other categories that we have to come with. So, and I didn't want to halt the conversation, but I'll definitely get some more uh, questions to him that I'll, I'll share with you. Yeah, yeah. As we all sit around our tables on uh, Thanksgiving and, you know, we go around and say what well, we have to be thankful for this past year, I know I have to be thankful for being with each and every one of you because together we can make a difference in the city. And I hope in Thanksgiving 2018 we'll be able to give thanks that we have made a difference in Fort Worth. Uh, with that, I know Rabbi Bloom always uh, starts us off in a prayer, but I'm going to ask for a closing prayer since this is the week of Thanksgiving. And Bishop Kirkland, I will ask you to provide that prayer for us. Thank you. <laughs> Father, let us be thankful of our ability to that when we witness and see injustice, that we don't look the other way, make us conscious that there are others who are depending on our transparency and our due diligence to do what is right for this city. And for all that you've done, not for a day of things, a season of things, but a lifetime of things, we offer up to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Happy holidays. Do we leave the envelope there or something?